All right. It's the Red Room. It's time for the Red Room. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in with me tonight. And probably you, as I, are great, am, are, <laughs> we are grateful to be in the warm this evening when there's a blizzard across so many miles. I love being here at my cockpit in my Red Room, my office at home, and being able to share with you and do my work without having to even get out in the cold and ice. Anyway, welcome. This is February. It's my favorite month because it's the, the month that represents love. And FYI, a year ago, as my Valentine's Day gift to Jack, I started the Red Room. So um, I'm coming up on one year of broadcasting. And thank you so much for tuning in tonight because it's so much fun when I have people to quote unquote play with me. So um, this month I took the advantage of February to talk about real love, intimate love, romantic love. We all, if we're healthy, crave it and um, agonize over it, are fulfilled more than we can describe by it, and it is very complex, very rich, and it, it morphs, and we sculpt it. So I'm very interested in the questions that you have for me, and I uh, created handouts tonight, and the topic that I'll talk about and hopefully answer your questions on is the ways that we lose romance. This is part of my um, fourth chapter in my designer marriage book on romantic partners and when we think about an intimate relationship it's really two things it's we are best friends which means we share everything and we happily share everything and we are romantic which means we've got that chemistry between us it's that romantic sexy alive bond that um, it's hard to describe, isn't it? And yet, when you find the one, there's nobody else, no matter how handsome or beautiful, no matter how young or old or appealing they are, they are really, there's no chemistry there. There's no interest there because you found the one where that chemistry bond is connected, unless you've experienced some of those things which deplete the romantic bond and there are many of them um, recently I've been working with a couple where actually I've had two couples over the last year come to me and they have some sadness about them because they started their relationship in a way where they didn't feel like it was just the right way and they have we most of us have an idealistic side where we want our true love and our intimate relationship, our marriage, our um, beloved, all of that, we want it to be the right way because it deserves to be the right way, quote unquote, which is how our, our ideal might look. And yet sometimes we start a romantic relationship and it's not the romantic way or the traditional idealistic way. Sometimes um, even in certain cultures there are arranged marriages and I don't know if you've seen that wonderful movie um, um, just a minute it'll come to me Ma um, Monsoon Wedding is that right? I think so. It, anyway it's about an arranged marriage and um, how people, if they're matched, have a choice whether or not to, to create that chemistry, that romantic bond with them, with each other. And so the couples that I've been working with, one of them started out um, where they met while one of them was married. And they ended up falling in love with each other and feeling that chemistry bond, and yet they didn't feel right about it because one of them wasn't free 
And so they kind of started that relationship and the person went through a divorce and then there was some time passed and then they finally got married. But the one who had been married never quite gave up the guilt about that, even though this was the real love of um, their lives, that kind of hung on over the years. And when they came to see me with the problems that we, they were having, we went way back to that very beginning thing and we needed to make peace with it, to grieve about it really. And then uh, another couple, and this is not uncommon, a couple get uh, starts dating and they uh, accidentally get pregnant and they then want to do the right thing and get married and find that you know they're they're co-parents immediately they don't have the time to create that romantic bond and a kind of a stride together as a couple and so that romantic bond maybe wasn't quite strengthened enough or it wasn't there or they didn't have a chance to do it at any rate there are many ways how our romantic bond might be disrupted even from the very beginning. You look beautiful in red, by the way, somebody said. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, that's a nice um, Valentine romantic um, thing. Makes a girl feel good with a compliment. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm curious how you feel your romance has been dampened or sometimes lost, or how you've rebuilt it. And I wanted to talk tonight about how we lose it. And there are kind of secret ways or hidden ways that we lose our romantic bond. And most of you know, I'm sure, because probably most of you have tuned in before, um, it's natural to lose that chemistry bond that's so intense and absolutely delicious from the first uh, from the beginnings of the relationship when you fall in love and become completely obsessed with the wonder of the other person and that chemistry that intense chemistry then of course dwindles and if we don't if we don't care about it if we don't keep feeding it if we don't pay attention to it if we don't um, keep sculpting it it kind of just dwindles away and vanishes. And some couples come to me and they say that they haven't felt the romance in years. And um, sometimes they've got some um, hidden resentments or anger or hurts. And then that builds a hardening of the heart. And it's a road where we have to heal those things that are held in the heart so that the heart can soften and open and then the romantic bond can be fostered, given life, fed, nourished and um, have it feel warm and alive and happy in, in between the two of you. So I wanted to look tonight at the ways that we lose that bond because each one of us probably has more than one way that our romantic bond has been dampened or lost in some in in some dimension or other and that these are all things we can do something about really and truly we can <clears throat> so on the first page of your handout I, uh, <laughs> I put up at the top there a silly cartoon where it looks like Donald Duck and some other duck, and I really don't know who that is. Uh, but it doesn't look ha healthy, happy, and it looks like she might be um, a little bit bitchy or naggy or um, complaining or judgmental, whatever it is. And that, of course makes us close down the heart. Her heart is already closed because she's angry and he's going to close his heart because he's going to protect himself from her. So that part is when you have fights that aren't resolved, when you have um, 
and when you haven't developed emotional intelligence or conflict resolution skills or you know conflict resolution skills I don't like that term it's so you know cold and intellectual more like when you have differences you need to be able to complain about your differences and figure it out and solve the problem and there are simple ways and quite a few different ways and different couples of course have their own style of how they do that um, some people need space to calm themselves down and they do much better when they can just get away and think some people want to go right into it and talk sincerely and figure it out each couple you need to trust yourself what your style is so that you can talk about differences and solve them um, of course we all have differences we're just even even our gender is usually different um, so I put here it's natural entropy going down do nothing you will lose the romance if we don't keep it afloat by keeping breathing life into it it will sink and the ways that we lose that um, romantic energy partly is if we don't do something and partly as if we're doing other things that replace the energy and the time necessary to breathe life into the rom romantic bond. So I put that my first paragraph, best, best friends share interests and grow together in the same direction. Not all the same directions, mind you. You know, we'll have our own interests and we need to find something together as a couple that we share as an interest. And some of you know that Jack and I share a passion for um, a chamber music organization in Dallas called Voices of Change. That is one of our shared interests. We have other differing interests, but that one is one that we're both passionate about and we both serve and we serve together. And it's always fun, sometimes disconcerting, and always meaningful. So you want to go together in the same direction with something. But without being romantic, the marriage can lapse into a filial or what I call Hansel and Gretel relationship, which means brother and sister, roommates in other words. A co-parent relationship where your two parents working as a team, taking care of the kids and the house and all the responsibilities, but you aren't um, lovers in, in that romantic sense or a paternal parent-child relationship where one or the other of you um, feels like you're in control or you're responsible and the other one doesn't show up with as much energy or self-discipline or um, um, presence in the family or your marriage or your lifestyle. So um, the first one I put, well, Let's look at the, the words around the top of the page. Childlike. If you're kids, you can't be sexy. Adolescents think they are, but they're not. Sorry, kids, but uh, teenagers get involved in what feels like romantic relationships to them. But until you have the depth of um, the mature systems, you don't have the robustness to handle all the exigencies of life. And that's why kids, teenagers that get into romantic relationships, it's fraught with gossip and pain and misunderstanding. And um, I, um, I put a comment on my blog this week about a young couple that talked to me. And uh, the, the sadness that I have for these adolescents that get in relationships and then they have children um, so that's a whole nother topic, but childlike, um, too casual. Um, I'll never forget a couple. Um, they came in to see me and he, they were both professionals, but when he sat, he kind of sat on the sofa in my office and kind of, you know, kind of loosey goosey. He was in a suit and tie, but he's just really, really casual, laid back. And she was... Um, elegantly dressed and very much 
the courteous and um, gracious lady. And it was hard for her because she was so gracious to say something about, I don't think, I think she tolerated it for so long that there were some other things in their marriage that um, had then, of course, because of this, become irritating. But I, you know, I asked him to conduct himself more like a gentleman because he was married to a gracious lady. He was too casual. He, he, he didn't show up for her like a gentleman, like a, a man. And there are, of course, there are other ways of being too casual. People who are too casual, who don't comport themselves like adults, maybe they're just too loosey-goosey like teenagers or college students, and don't respect themselves, how they appear, how their space appears, and then they don't end up respecting their um, partner, their beloved. Um, sometimes we're unhealthy, emotionally unhealthy, unhealthy, um, recently I was talking to someone about the difficulties of living with someone with a mental illness such as bipolar disorder when you're just not sure who this is going to be. It's not going to be your beloved, it's going to be this person who is angry and um, foul-mouthed and it's hard to withstand someone who has a mental illness and then they come back to, to themselves and here's your beloved but Meanwhile, you've been accosted by all this negativity, and it's really hard to not harden your heart with that. But we do. We do. We are able to be unconditionally loving. And of course, unhealthy in the sense of a terminal illness, and then healthy and unhealthy in a sense of things that we could do, and I wish we would do something about, which means lose weight, um, be fit, take the time to behave like an adult, which means make sure you work out however you like to work out, and to have a good body image, not only um, for your relationship, but for yourself. If you're unhealthy physically, you're not a good lover. You're not in, in the physical, emotional, mental sense. Um, some people, in, interestingly enough, are competitive with each other. This, sometimes you'll see this if there's a couple who have a profession in the same field. And of course, that's um, then making the other person your enemy. And you can't afford that. It'll kill your romance immediately. Or sometimes it can be juicy because it's a healthy competition because you've got a kind of a sparkle in your eye and you kind of like it. And um, you're well matched and you spar with a sense of humor and delight in each other. So that kind of competition can be um, kind of juicy and kind of sexy and exciting. <clears throat> but oftentimes uh, competitive means that you're working against or at odds with each other. And cute. Mm. Um, if you're too cute, um, you're not really engaged as an adult and available for deep emotional intimacy. It's kind of staying with the mask on. You know what I mean? Uh, are these things, are these examples that I'm sharing with you hitting home? Does this make sense? Is, is this following for you? And please chime in with a question. Whether or not it's on the topic, um, I'm just here for you tonight, as always, wanting to answer whatever concerns or questions you have. I love doing that. Um, so I'm looking at these, these little peripheral words I put down, and then... Um, Sometimes the filial relationship, the Hansel and Gretel relationship, which means two um, youngsters holding each other up, two like um, brother and sister, where you take care of each other, your friends, but not sexy. So this brother and sister were best friends, but not romantic. Well, your brother and sister aren't supposed to be romantic. That's kind of that's extremely disgusting and unhealthy, pretty much, right? Um, they supported and protected each other, but the male-female chemistry of adults could never be a part of the relationship. Some couples avoid maturity because they don't want to grow up for various reasons. Sometimes they're afraid to lose their best friend because this relationship has become best friends, and that's really precious. 
Unfortunately, when we avoid adulthood, we also stifle the ability to be romantic and sexy and um, bonded as a man and a woman. It avoids a deep, meaningful, intimate connection. Um, low income. Low income is grinding. It's one of the um, most profound and pervasive stressors on the planet. When people live in poverty, it just grinds away at their sense of life and health and it's exhausting and you'd end up not having much to give. Now if that's the case, what we want you to do is even in a situation where you are stressed financially, you need more than ever there to maintain your friendship and your intimacy and your ability to make love and heal each other sexually because that's one of the things that gives you relaxation and life and contentment even if it's just that part of your life. If you have that, it's a foundation that gives you peace and love inside. Um, then there is mom and dad. Uh, I could make a long list of the couples who have come to see me and are afraid that they've completely lost their marriage because they've ended up just little by little by little by little and sometimes they have lost their marriage. Um, they've filled their lives together and their home and their activities with caring for their children which is wonderful you know and yet they didn't really notice that they were losing their mutual activities and their romantic bond and their deep meaningful bond because you know they still talk they talk meaningfully and mostly about the kids. You know, they're at the athletic events, at the musical events. They're supporting the kids in whatever way the kids need it, um, whether they're little ones or teenagers or even in college, and have forgotten that it's critically important that they are a man and wife, that he holds the role not only of dad but of husband. She holds the role not only of mom, but wife. And that if we don't pay attention to those roles of husband and wife, man and woman, other than mom and dad and co-parents, the romance goes away. And that means that if you're still best friends and co-parents, you've got a lot to work with, of course. And um, sometimes it just it's really fun redeveloping that bond and sometimes you really do need to get away and go for some romantic weekends or put something new into your life that you both love that's adult and that the two of you just share dating other couples and sometimes it's a long road because you've lost each other and sometimes couples actually lose, lose their marriage because all they have um, anymore as they've grown over the years, is they love their kids. And, you know, they love each other for loving their kids, but it's, it's no longer a marriage, no longer a romantic relationship. Um, some, and sometimes that means we're too busy. Too busy with many different things. Of course, too busy with children, yes. And too busy with um, many other things. And one of the things that um, I think about is if our lives are very stressful and too full and we don't take care of each other in our marriage or in our intimate relationship what happens is we look somewhere else for that comfort and it often ends up being some sort of habit bad habit or addiction um, you know you could end up instead of looking for fun and meaning and relaxation and rejuvenation with your with each other you use alcohol or cigarettes or workaholism workaholism or just staying um, on a, a video game all the time or just watching TV or sometimes reading or Facebook whatever it is that that coping mechanism that you've been using becomes more important than your beloved.
more important than your marriage. And it, you know, sometimes that's a, sim a symptom that you're too busy and you feel like you don't have the extra time for your spouse and you just get these little crumbs of treats, whether it's food or alcohol or a video game, and it displaces the, the time and the energy that you need to pay attention to your relationship. <clears throat> so it's very important that you get away from all that. I know um, sometimes it's just as simple as going out for dinner to a casual restaurant where all of your distractions are somewhere else and the two of you sit across the table and connect, talk, appreciate, enjoy each other. Um, actually, and sometimes you do need an individual vacation just to get away and rest so that you really miss each other and you come back and there's a honeymoon and that's really nice too. So then let's go to the second page. Not romantic. Real romance is for grown-ups. So as I looked at on the first page, Hansel and Gretel, um, they just don't have, for, number one, they're siblings so that's not going to work, but if you treat each other as siblings, um, it's not the way a man and a woman conduct themselves. And I think in these times, and it's a little sad for me, and I, I never mean to be judgmental or um, prejudiced in any way. However, in these times, there's a, there's a kind of cultural tradition, and maybe you see it too, where it's part of the culture doesn't want to grow up, wants to be playful, wants to be casual, um, wants to just take breaks and not really bring the full life of their um, passion to their day-to-day -day life. They're just a little too passive, a little too loosey-goosey, and just really don't want to behave like adults, don't want to uh, put on the tie for the lady or don't want to um, do her hair for her man, whatever it is. You know what I'm, do you know what I'm talking about? And you're relating to this. <laughs> Let me hear from you, dears. Um, so then uh, Peter Pan and Wendy, of course, which means Peter Pan comes in and ooh, he is just the cat's pajamas. He is wonderful. He want, he takes her away to Never Never Land. And of course, there's a book written on the Peter Pan complex. And of course, then there's Wendy too, where Peter Pan never wants to grow up because he has a whole lot of fun going on adventures. He doesn't have to have a job or be responsible for a paycheck or a house or children or a wife. So some couples agree not to grow up. They falsely assume that growing up can take all the fun out of life. Peter Pan and Wendy types can continue to live in Never Never Land in the magical childlike attitude, but as Dr. David Snarsh, one of my favorite authors and therapists, writes in his book, The Sexual Crucible, passionate intimacy requires the robust emotional intelligence of adults. So if you really want passionate intimacy, that requires that you think about taking on the fullness of your manhood and your womanhood. Um, then I've got here um, Romeo and Juliet and two quote-unquote star-crossed child lovers found romance and best friendship but they allowed the family feuds to run their lives rather than having the maturity to individuate from their families because they were kids, they were just teenagers, they didn't know, they didn't have the fullness of maturity to find a real marriage together. So they killed themselves to avoid the family rather than choosing an adult life together in a place outside of the family pressures. And I know you've encountered this somewhere where um, a couple will get married and one or the other of them has what we call an emotionally incestuous bond with one of the parents. And that means that for him, his mom comes first because he feels like the good son takes care of his mom. And then his wife. Um, or for her, her mom comes first or her dad comes first. 
and she talks to her mom every day about all the things and then kind of um, drains off her best friend energy with her mom and doesn't need to talk about it with her husband, which means then that best friendship bond isn't created and she's draining too much away from her husband and her marriage relationship and therefore she, they, the energy isn't there to have a deep intimate bond. Does this make sense? Any questions about this, dear ones? I love when you ask me questions or you, when you chime in. It feels, feels like you're in my conversation. Um, sometimes um, couples travel or one of them travels and travel being gone can you can use that either to add juice to your relationship where it's like a honeymoon when you get back together again and you talk on the phone all week and you keep that best friendship alive and you do plans and such or the travel can begin to pull you apart where you're feeling disconnected and if you've got a problem in the relationship sometimes jealousy will develop or paranoia about how what the other person's doing well either they're gone or you're gone so travel can sometimes be the, the thing that drains uh, the romance from your relationship virtual reality um, staying on video games um, I have a great sadness about this. Um, video games and the computer, um, if a person gets too much of their identity and their fun and their relaxation wrapped up in the stimulus of video games, sometimes it's hard for um, a spouse to have the relationship with the spouse to be that juicy, that energetic, that exciting, you know what I mean? Same thing with a warrior who's come back from the war or a police officer or an operating room nurse or somebody who, who uses pornography. Um, those other experiences have such intensity that, that jar your system with so much um, energy that when you come to spend time with your beloved it's kind of like uh, not quite so exciting so that's something you know whenever I work with a police officer I remind them that they're going to have to work doubly hard to keep the love alive in their marriage for various reasons just because of what happens on the job so sometimes travel, sometimes virtual reality, sometimes your job, those things are going to drain the romance away from your intimate relationship. Um, let's see, lack of novelty and arousal. Okay, um, you know, well, we want two things in a marriage, and they're huge, big, very complex things. We want to be best friends, and we want to be romantic. And how we maintain those over time you know, that working on your marriage is novelty and arousal. Novelty meanings, the foundational aspect of human beings, one of the ones that is there from birth is curiosity, interest in learning, interest in something new. Novelty means doing something new, learning something new, finding out something new, sharing something new. That's a novelty. And uh, it can be anything, that novelty. It could be going to a new restaurant. It could be planning a trip to a foreign country where you've never been. It could be learning a new language. It could be um, trying out a new recipe for dinner, um, cooking together at home. It could be anything but doing something new, not getting in that humdrum, ordinary rut that's so easy um, for us to get into in certain times of our lives. When we have children around, sometimes um, that's obviated because they're always doing something different and bringing something different to our lives and to our homes or to our activities. Um, 
So that's why I put the, the stack of laundry on the handout, the humdrum. If all you do is the same old, same old every week, every week, there's no novelty there and then no arousal. And arousal is, yes, sexual arousal. You want to get sexually aroused so that you can have uh, a satisfying, yummy sex life. And arousal in the sense of excitement. Kind of like, ooh, ooh, this is exciting. Ooh, I like this. Ooh, my ears are perked. Or um, I'm a little flirtatious. Or I'm excited about something. Or the music that's playing. Whatever it is that excites you, we need to have that kind of lift. Not that we stay there all the time, you know, so that we get manic. But that every once in a while, hmm, something lifts. Um, so humdrum doing the laundry all the time and doing nothing but just staying in the rut, your, your romance is going to flatten and lose life. Um, the one at the bottom, the, the little picture down here at the bottom, that's this, the two little hearts, it says, um, thanks for always having my back. Um, if when you go to the store to buy a valentine for your husband or your wife or your lover and your valentines just says thanks for always having my back mm. you know that's what we do when we love somebody we have their back and you know maybe that's a valentine for having my back through an emergency situation or through um, my dad dying or something like that but it's not romantic you know and so that can be, if that's a pervasive element in your relationship, that can be shallow. Thanks for having my back. I'm not going to open my heart to you, but I'm going to thank you for being there and, you know, for me trusting you. Do you see how that works? And sometimes that means you've got a mask on where um, you're courteous, you're kind, you're thankful, you're appreciative. And yet, you don't open your heart to get soft and embrace. You don't expose the innermost um, parts, secrets, feelings, dreams, worries that you hold in your heart and soul about who you are. And if you don't reveal that, if you don't open your heart, then you can't have emotional intimacy. You're holding a mask. You're creating a barrier. And that will, whether or not you had that wonderful romantic chemistry, sooner or later, you'll kill it. You'll drain it if you hold that mask between you and your lover or you harden your heart between you and your lover. So the last paragraph that I wrote is, Many of the relationships we've observed from the past generations lack novelty and arousal. Think about our, our um, heritage and our forefathers. A lot of them didn't have time for art, culture, um, fun, learning, excitement. Maybe they did in sports or something like that. Uh, but they were working hard, especially in um, the Americas, where it's a lot of pioneering. Our infrastructure is still being built, where we don't have a lot of extra time for deepening with each other, learning relationships. We're out there earning an income and um, making sure that there's a roof over the head, there's food on the table, and we... Our previous heritage, a lot of them, I grew up in a pioneer setting where there wasn't much left over. I know my mom and dad really tried. They focused. They didn't want to be like other people um, in, in, the, in the past where they saw the hardships. They lived with the hardships. And so one of the things that I miss most about my childhood is they had a little, just a little tiny cabin at the lake and we would go there sometimes on weekends and in the summer and we'd play you know in the water with the dad built a boat so that was the the way that we got away from um, just that grind that we inherited from the past where um, they didn't have much novelty and arousal it was pretty pretty thin what they had um, 
Couples kept their routine and didn't create new and exciting experiences for each other. But life may have, but not, not in, in the sense of being romantic much. And correct me if I'm wrong, if you know a couple that did that, I would love to hear about it. And mostly the uh, stories that I hear of generations previous to mine, they didn't. Um, so the majority of statements about marriage, when I research them, it's a little appalling, focus on judgments against either husbands or wives or the estate of matrimony. And here's a quote from Maggie Gallagher. She says, Optimism is America's birthright. There is no social problem Americans dare not attack. No problem that is except one. About marriage and marriage alone we despair. And that's why I'm a marriage counselor. <laughs> I love marriage and uh, the romantic relationship that being best friends and lovers it heals anything. It gives us strength through any of the adversities or the difficulties of life. It gives us one place where we come together at least, hold each other at night, and comfort each other, warm each other, make each other laugh, make love, and get renewal. Just the two of us. That's always there no matter where you live, no matter um, what your generation, if you're an adult, that coming together as a best friend and a lover is what I call the ultimate panacea. So that's there for us in our marriage relationship. It's not, it's not a despairing situation today because we really do know how to keep romance alive. And tonight we're talking about how it kind of slips away from us or how it, um, um, withers and and dries up or how it just was there and then it's gone and what we do is the cause of that it doesn't just vanish because it vanishes it vanishes because of what we do or don't do dear hearts it's our choice it's our art form if we choose um, we find ourselves in marriages which can be boring dominated by demands from family, work, friends, TV, video games, addictions, depression, physical weakness, low income, arguments, troubled kids, and on and on and on. And I, as an advocate, say, no. With today's knowledge, we can create what I am writing about, which is designer marriages. You design it for yourself, and you design it so that you have the romance, the best friendship, and the chemistry. You want to, we, I want to model and I want to help others model the true meaning of marriage for the next generations. Being passionate best friends can be an endless partnership of fun, creativity, joy, and gratitude until we die. And every once in a while you meet one of those marriages, don't you? And mostly people like to be around that. Nobody's asked me a question. Nobody's chimed in. And uh, I know you're listening. So that's me having moved through the materials that I brought for you tonight. Any questions or comments about that? Any, um, any challenges that you have that I mentioned or that I didn't mention that um, you're working on or troubled by? So somebody type me a question. I want to hear from you. Sometimes people are shy. Also, it doesn't have to be a question on the topic we talked about tonight. Um, as some of you know, uh, last month I was privileged to work with some of our soldiers, our um, soldiers returning from Iraq, and some of the people who were survivors of the Fort Hood killing a year ago and those people you know they're under a great deal of stress and their relationships are under a great deal of stress and one of the things that's really important when we face different stressors sometimes they're obvious like that 
and sometimes they're just the day-to-day -day humdrum where we don't have those things dialed into our lives that little by little by little just eat away at our relationship. We can let it happen. And we can let it happen without noticing. Or we can just watch it. And if we don't decide to change something, to add something fun, some novelty, to go the extra mile in some way for our beloved, it goes into that entropy and it starts going downward. Today, you know, I know that Jack's number one love language is words. So today, I, we were at home, I made him a bowl of soup, and I opened a nice bottle of red wine so that I could bring him a glass of wine with his chicken noodle soup. And I um, wanted to say I love you in some way, make it special. So I just um, cut out a circle of, of cardboard and wrote um, a love note on it and put it on the bottom of his wine glass. I'm so devoted to this. Every day I need to do something special um, for him because... Um, just recently, I've been going through old stacks of things, cleaning out my files to renew my space so that I can use my space for what I have today and tomorrow. And uh, I save all of our greeting cards for our friends and, of course, to each other. And so I was had some of those nice photograph boxes. And putting all the cards for him that I'd given him and all the cards in my box for me that he'd given to me over the years and there's so many and so many um, sincere words of love and appreciation and I'm thinking oh my gosh we've said so many things to each other and yet there's no end of saying loving things and appreciative things to each other oh good I've got some I've got some dialogue here okay um, I think my husband and I are doing okay. Yes. I just wish we had more time to be alone, kids, etc. Indeed. Although we love them so much, we need, I think, to do some rebalancing of priorities. Yes, dear. That, um, that is, um, one of those things where we kind of are, handling something and it kind of just goes off path and it get, maybe gets off path and you notice it and you say, oops, got to bring it back. And that's life, you know, everything is changing and evolving. And sometimes, you know, it's gotten off path, but not in any bad or negative way. You're just saying, whoops, wait a minute, we've lost contact with each other and we don't have time. And during the time when your kids are very active, it's a different thing you won't have as much time with each other. And that means that, what, the way I think about it, um, I want to jam-pack higher quality into a smaller space. So I want to take all of this, and I've only got this much time, I'm going to jam-pack it into a small space that when we do get together, it's really lovely and luscious and good. And so um, I would say, it usually when you've got kids and you're really active, it's going to take some planning in order to get something like that. And it would be really, really um, helpful if you could get away, which means other parents take your kids, you get away for, uh, you know, just if you're in Dallas, you go to Fort Worth and just stay in a hotel or a bed and breakfast and wake up with no kids and just go for walks. Jack and I do that sometimes. Fort Worth is like, um, going to another state, you know, and I know whatever city you're living in, there's a, there's somewhere that's not that far away where you can get, get away and get a, a concentrated piece of time. You will have to plan it, and then, of course, you want to plan something special. You want to, you know, if you're going to a hotel, you have flowers there for her, or you have special um, treats left there by the kitchen for him. Some Or you put something special in the suitcase so that you plan it, you make... You, you use various things um, to make it more intense. Let's see here. Um, 
so many of the things that you mentioned about marriage I have experienced. It is so easy to get so involved with the everyday, especially where children are involved. Yes, because we love them and they need us. It is so important to share interests and to grow together. I wasn't so good at it. I chose to focus on my kids and left my husband behind. And I can hear that's the way you say that, it's sad. And um, you know, it makes me think about when a baby is born. Um, it doesn't happen so much nowadays. Um, maybe not in our country, just the people that I know. But the baby has to be bonded to its mom's body. The baby has to be held and bonded. And if she's not aware, um, she could lose her bond with her husband. And because men, at that point, the baby needs daddy, yes, but not quite like an infant needs mommy. And if, if a woman doesn't hold the baby and then reach out and say, sweetie, come and bring him to you and the baby and help him find ways that he can interact with the two of you or with the baby himself, then it ends up kind of like being mommy and baby here and husband over there. And sometimes husbands feel lost or like, you know, they don't know how to belong. And then they feel disconnected and they end up feeling jealous of the baby or angry at their wife because they've lost their, their lover. And that's one of those ways where it's a healthy thing. We need to take care of that baby. And yet, if we're not sensitive to how that emotional interaction is happening, we, it, can, it can be divisive. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's easy to leave your husband behind, especially if he's working, if he has a 9-to-5 job somewhere else, or if he travels. Um, and then we need to be aware, both the husband and the wife, um, that when you are together, some way or another, you live out that 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 coupleness, that marriagehood, that husband and wifeness, um, because you know, really, true to truth to tell, it's one of the things that our children are starved for. That they want to see that mommy and daddy are a mommy and daddy, a man and wife, a man and woman, and that they are bonded and they're happy. It gives the children um, a sense of stability, of course, but. And, I guess I should say, it also shows our children what it's like when they grow up to find their mate, their beloved, and to, be, to not get into a relationship with somebody who isn't their best friend and lover, who doesn't respect them and adore them and treat them well and have that fun, happy, laughing playful, interactive experience. The kids want to see us together. Role modeling is the most powerful method of teaching. And role modeling your romance for your kids, they need to see you bonded. Something inside them gets warm and, and happy when they know mommy and daddy are happy together. Of course, not that no, there are some couples that abandon their kids because they're always out playing with and partying with their friends you know what I mean. So it's, it's um, let's see. It is so important to share interests and to grow together. Now, when you've got kids, sometimes the kids' interests become your interests, and that's really cool. You know, like um, if one of your kids is a hockey player, and the both of you go to the, uh, all the, the whole family goes to hockey games and you watch hockey games at home. And then you create a mutual interest around hockey and do cool stuff. Not just going to the kids' hockey games, but making that something that the kids learn about in terms of the sport, um, going to professional games, doing, having special food and special, like, pajama parties as a family or with other kids coming over or with um, you as a couple um, doing something. Maybe you, you're learning to skate together. 
So find a way, if, if the kids have an interest that is an interest that you can share, make sure that you do that as a couple, not just with the kids or going off with the kids. Uh, you can cultivate that. If, if one of your daughters is in ballet, make sure you go to the professional ballet performances. Not just your, you know, um, Jack and I helped recently, uh, Jennifer teaches um, middle school band, and she set up to take some of her students to the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, the Meyerson Symphony Hall, and she asked if, us if we would be um, chaperones. Many of those children, these are kids that are playing classical instruments. Most of those children had never been to the symphony. And then, between you and me, how many of their parents have ever been to the symphony? And did the mom and dad go as on a date to the symphony and then take the children sometimes too? So if you have something that is an interest or um, a passion for your child, you can weave that, you can sculpt that into your whole family life. Um, any thoughts, any suggestions? We're nearing the end of our hour and um, you've been most attentive and um, listening. And thank you for your comments. Any any thoughts, any any questions, any concerns that you have? Yeah, and it, you know, it's interesting also, I want to say this. I remind you of this. Children, because when you have children in your home and they're growing, it really is of paramount importance. Your marriage has to come before because the children have to be protected by the marriage. Um, but one of the things I think our children need to learn most is about change, which means um, something needs to be improved or something needs to be released and something new needs to be done. And if they experience change with you and the family and you've planned it and lived through it and shown them how that happens, then they can handle change anywhere they go for the rest of their lives. You know, all the quote-unquote army brats, the, the children or the husbands and wives who are associated with the military and who are moved from post to post. Those people, all of to a man or a woman, <laughs> they are all comfortable with change. Some of them do have a problem with um, really opening up and making friends because they were hurt so many times by losing friends. Some of them are just really happy to make friends wherever they go. So, um, when you come up against this and you're noticing that um, you've lost the time that you need for your marriage, um, let the kids see you do that. Let them experience how, ah, we're noticing we need to change something. And kids, we're going out on a date and um, then you organize something different so that the kids take care of themselves or they have a new sitter or something or other or staying overnight at somebody's house because now it's time for us to to have some husband and wife some mom and dad time and you know I don't know if you're good at this but you also need to be able to make love when you've got kids around and that means you do it with good cheer and not oh god the kids are around um, the kids need to know that there's adult time and that there's mom and dad time and that you have a lock on your bedroom door and sometimes it's fun you have a fun sign on your door that says this is um, leave mom and dad alone time or um, it's like uh, grown-ups need to just get away for a little bit and have intimate time or friendship time or quiet time together so make sure you take care of that um, Thank you, Heather. You always give me a lot to think about. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you so much for telling me. Your advice and experience is amazing. Sorry I don't always get to listen in on Wednesdays. Oh, bless you for saying that. I hope that it is. I want it to be. And thank you for um, affirming that I'm on the right track. Uh, that's, that's inspiring to me. But tonight was great. Thank you so much. Yes! <laughs> Wonderful information, Heather. Thank you as always. Oh, dear hearts. Uh, it's wonderful to have fans. You know that? And it's this is what we all dream of, that we find our work, that we love it, and that it makes a difference in the world. So 
I want to mentor people to do that and in order to do that I really feel as if I need to be walking my talk and as you can tell I am. I love this more than anything. I'm so glad that I give you things to think about and I want to do it in a healthy, happy and encouraging way because you don't need to get down on yourselves or worry about things. Just find ways to be more creative and um, to make the change happen and show yourselves, your, um, your spouse and your children that's, well, this isn't working. Well, we have an opportunity. Let's figure out what we're going to do. And maybe we get to try out various things and we'll experiment with good cheer and a willingness to be honest, no masks and adventure. You don't get that um, uh, marriage alone we despair. No, we don't despair about marriage anymore. Um, I also wanted to read this, these two quotes. Here's a quote. Um, I'm going to close with these two quotes. One is from Groucho Marx. Some people claim that marriage interferes with romance. There's no doubt about it. Anytime you have a romance, your wife is bound to interfere. Putting down your wifey, right? So, and though we've heard dozens of stories like that, where in the past, like um, Maggie Gallagher says, about marriage and marriage alone, we despair. We used to. And I'm advocating we don't need to anymore. And then this from Katherine Hepburn, of good, for goodness sakes. If you want to sacrifice the admiration of many men for the criticism of one, go ahead and get married. <laughs> well, some people did experience that. But I think we need to live la dolce vita in our marriages. After all, in your home, nobody tells you what to do. It's your private space. You and your beloved can have all the fun, flirtatiousness, yumminess, and best friendship that you decide you want to have. And I encourage you to do that. And if you need help, I'll figure out what I need to do to give you some ideas for the next step. I can't determine the design of your marriage, but I'll give you some ideas to hopefully inspire some new designs that you create for yourself. And as always, thank you for tuning into the Red Room. Um, this month of romance, may you do something extraordinary and a little bit daring, or maybe a lot daring, that you've never done before on the account of the love that you have for the person that happens to be devoted to you. So thank you for tuning into the Red Room. Good night, everyone, and I'll see you next week, and we'll talk more about marriage, romance, best friendship, and intimate love. <laughs>